Hey, Ron. Lynn? Yeah, I'm in. Hi. How you doing, Mike? Afternoon. Day three. Day three. We're very <laughs> excited. Very exciting. Yeah. Hey, how does everything look, Ron, Lynn, from, from my perspective here? Everything okay on your side? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. good. I couldn't put a fireplace in behind me like Lynn. <laughs> so I, I went with my favorite Christmas tree. You would uh, sell holidays. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's perfect. All right, good, good. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hey, welcome back. For those of you that have been with us over the last two days, wow, we've had some great programming, great presenters, and certainly a list of great resources and Thank you. Thank you so much for coming back and, and being with us. And and for some of you that are brand new to our programming, and this is your first time with us, we've got a treat. We've got a live cooking presentation today, and I'm getting hungry already. I can't wait to see what she's going to be cooking up. Uh, by the way, my name is Ron Sukenik. I'm one of the cadre of speakers provided by Yellow Ribbon to help facilitate and moderate the event and on behalf of your host, the Army Reserve Family Programs and Building Healthy Military Families, I, I, I welcome you and, and I want to thank you for sharing your time. I, you know, it's a busy time of the year. There's 21 days left to the end of the year. My God, and you've chose to spend some time with us today. So we thank you so much. Uh, by the way, just so you know a little bit about me, and again, if you're new to the program today, uh, uh, Ron Sukenik, I joined the Army back in 1967. Wow, sounds like a long time ago. I ended up in Vietnam in 1968, got out in 1970, missed the Army, and went back in and got lucky to retire from the United States Army Reserve. So the good news about retiring from the military is they take care of you. They give you lots of benefits. They send me a check every month for the rest of my life. And whatever Medicare doesn't cover, TRICARE for Life does. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I know it's been a crazy year for all of us. My God, this, this pandemic has been crazy. But, you know, we used to be able to bring these events to you face-to-face -face all over the country uh, for Yellow Ribbon. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to do it. So we can bring it to you and we do this on Teams and on Zoom. Um, and I really want to offer some best practices. Again, for those that have been with us over the last two days, you know this already. And for those that are new to us today, um, please, if you're participating in the Teams room, the Microsoft Teams room, turn on your cameras so that we can see your faces. We, we'd love to see your faces. Make sure you're in a well-lit area. But please be aware of what's going on around you and, and ensure that we don't see anything 
you do not want us to see. Next, because you may have some background noise, uh, please make sure your microphone is muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the raise hand feature, which is found in the toolbox below, the toolbar below. Uh, just make sure when you ask your questions, uh, unmute the microphone and speak clearly and concisely. Uh, in fact, if you'd like, you can also put your information in the chat box. I'll get that to the presenter. Uh, look, the bottom line is we want your involvement. We, we want your questions. We want your experience. We want you to share whatever you want to share at any time during the presentation. So don't be afraid to ask those questions as we go along. By the way, if you're joining us through VPN, those private networks for best results, please disconnect from the VPN. And I want everybody to know that the event is being recorded and broadcasted all over the world on YouTube and Facebook, but only registered individuals are given access to the platforms. Uh, also as a disclaimer, uh, all information from the presentation is for educational purposes only. We're excited to have people joining us, uh, as I mentioned, from Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Uh, by the way, you're not able to use your camera. We know that. Uh, but we encourage you to utilize the comments section to be active participants. Again, I'll say it again. We want to hear your experience. We want to hear what you're thinking. We want to hear what you're getting out of it. And we want Nadia, thank you for smiling. We want everybody to be happy. This is a happy day. It is. Look, 21 days left to the end of the year. Let's make today the beginning for a great ending. Uh, in fact, I want to do something right now. I want everybody to go to the chat box. Go to the chat box right now. And once again, please tell us if you're a family member, a service member, a civilian, uh, and what branch of the military are you affiliated with? And we know you can be with the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and of course, the Space Force. So just put it right in there right now. We appreciate it. Army Reserve. Let's go, Army Reserve. I think Army's getting ready to play Navy and football. Go, Army, right? Uh, spouse, we love families. We love families. Uh, you, you know, since World War II, less than 3% of our population has ever served, and Today, the Pentagon says about a half a percent is what's protecting the freedom for 99 and a half percent of this country. So really, uh, we're a small family. There's about 22 million veterans right now in the country. Thank you, Alabama Military One Source. Wow, what a great organization. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, now, what I want to do is I want to get things started. And I want to be using a fun tool in the form of a polling question. We're going to take a little bit of a survey, and this includes Facebook and YouTube participants. You will have the opportunity to respond to questions using your SMS or text messaging. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to take your phone, uh, and I want you to text the capital YRRP1 to 504-684-1111. I want you to text to YRRP1 to 504-684-1111. Now, once you've connected, you're in. So anytime we ask you questions, you don't have to keep doing that. You're already going to be in. Now, let me just give you a quick example, and then I want to have a question. If I was to ask you, what is your favorite animal? And you're given A for dog, B for cat, C for tiger, D for lion. We want you to answer, if your answer is dog, simply text with an A to the poll. Now, I want to go ahead and connect again to the, if you're connected to the poll, let me go ahead and give you a polling question. I think that'll come right up in a moment. Uh, if we can get that right up. Okay, well, there you are, joining the poll. So everybody's done that. Thank you. Uh, and I want, I'm looking for the poll question. I think we've got one. Uh, is that polling question coming up? <clears throat> I don't see it coming up, but I, oh, oh, there you go. Have you heard of the USO? 
have you heard of the USO? I just want you to say A or B. The answer is yes or no. A or B. Uh, and I will tell you this. The USO does great things for people every day. And certainly as a service member that retired from the military, whether I was in Vietnam and the USO put on shows, whether I'm at an airport and they give me a place to rest, uh, what a great organization. So it looks like everybody that's participating uh, is 100 percent. Wow, that's incredible. So so thank you for that. So everybody knows about the USO and the great stuff they do. And they always look for volunteers and they always look for donations. Uh, what I want to do right now is I want to move right into our program. I want to introduce uh, one of our guest presenters that we've had a couple of days ago, which is the Mississippi State Coordinator for for Healthy Communities. And that's Dr. Mangle Shanks. And, and even though they're telling me that it's my friend from building healthy military communities, I think we're kind of like family by now. Dr. Shanks, are you with us? Dr. Shanks, are you with us? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what I will do. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't see Dr. Shanks, uh, but I would like to say Miss Lynn Schultz, the oh, Florida State Coordinator. Oh yeah, hi. Is that Dr. Shanks? Yes, I'm having um, difficulty financial. I'm not financial, but maybe some of that too. But <laughs> I'm having. Some technical difficulties. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We loved what you did the other day in programming, but I wanted to introduce you because because you're 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 now part of the family. So go ahead, take exactly. it over. Exactly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited for this collaboration. We've had a great time this week. Hopefully, if you have not had the opportunity uh, coming on Monday or Tuesday. You can go back and listen to uh, the recording and, and, and find all kinds of wonderful resources. Uh, because on our first day, we introduced you to BHMC, which is uh, near and dear to my heart, Building Healthy Military Communities, and my counterpart is there in Florida. And so please go back and uh, listen to that, as well as we had a wonderful personal financial counselor on that gave you information concerning budgeting and how that relates to food insecurities. And on yesterday, we had a wonderful uh, information from United Way, the 211, that uh, provided information on how we can connect with food pantries in your area, just all kinds of information, as well as SNAP, uh, Supplemental Net, um, Nutritional Assistance Program. And those things are available for, for those that may qualify for those services. But on today, you know, if you're thinking about hanging up before we get to the end, please don't because we got What's Cooking, a wonderful food demonstration that's going to be done by our Florida Extension Services. Also, we're going to hear from the USO today talking about Healthy Families Initiative. But what's near and dear to me today is someone that live in my own state, resources for the Mississippi uh, Corporate Extension Services. So at this time, we are going to introduce to you uh, Dr. David Bias. And I'll give him, give him, do a short bio on him so you can know a little bit more about him. Dr. David Byers, who is the PhD uh, State Health Specialist in Mississippi State University and Associate Professor in the Department of Food Service, Food Science, excuse me, Nutrition and Health Promotion here at Mississippi State University. Dr. Byers leads research based health related efforts across the, the 82 counties here in our state with a focus on preventing and managing chronic disease and promoting uh, and the promotion of mental health. He's also authored 40 peer review articles published in leading health journals. journals. He, looks, he works closely also with a team of about 15 individuals across the state and at his campus area also to uh, positively impact community with better health outcome. He is a proud native of Rankin County with roots as far back as six generation. Wow. He now lives in Starkville, Mississippi with his wife, Katie Crawford Byers, and they have three children. So at this time, Dr. Byers, I would like for you to take the floor and provide the information for us concerning Mississippi Extension Service. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Shanks. It's an honor to be with y'all. And 
And I'll tell you, like a lot of you, I'm working from home um, and my kids are are schooling virtually. So I, it is the nature of this pandemic life that we're living. I'm not going to apologize, but I am going to forewarn you that at any point, my four-year-old could bust through the room with an important <laughs> announcement about a new Lego creation or or some kind of uh, um, uh, show that she's found on YouTube that that she's uh, not supposed to be watching. And uh, so if that happens, uh, just I, I'll just ask for a quick time out. I'll excuse her and I'll be back with you. Um, we can go ahead and pull the slides up if that's all right. I'd like to get this conversation going. So I'll talk with you a little bit about how Extension can partner with you to create healthy, strong families and, and communities. I know that y'all heard quite a bit yesterday from some Extension partners. Dr. Shelnut gave a wonderful presentation um, about the history of Extension, and I want to just remind you uh, some of what, what you heard from her if you were on, and if you're not, it'll all be uh, new for, you, for some of you. But first, I would invite you all to just comment in the chat box. I don't have a polling question, but I would like for you to ask, when you think about cooperative extension, what comes to mind? For some of you, it might be um, uh, agriculture-related issues, or it might be uh, quilting clubs, or it could be 4-H. But I'd love to hear from you. What, when you think about extension, what what comes to mind? Um, and, and get a little dialogue going there, and and, and maybe have some chat chat with each other about uh, how extension has impacted your life uh, in one way or the other. How you know it has. Um, so when we think about the role of extension in health, I just want to acknowledge, next slide, we can uh, advance to the next slide. I, I, I want to acknowledge that um, people don't always think about extension as, a, a, as a, a service provider that offers interventions on health. But when we think about health in a more contemporary sense, we recognize that it's not just what happens in a clinic. It's not just interactions that happen between a physician or a nurse practitioner, PA, and a, and a, and a patient. Health is about so much more than that. We recognize now that health is about our our, our overall huh, excuse me our overall well being. It's about um, factors uh, be, beyond just our physical uh, physical outcomes. And we know that there are a lot of factors that go into uh, determining how we are healthy or what might be causing us to be unhealthy. There's this framework called the social determinants of health. Um, when we think about social determinants of health, we're talking about economic stability. And we heard a couple of days ago from a financial planner um, or financial counselor. Education, we all know that it's important for us to, to get our education, to get through school and to, and to be equipped for the workforce and for uh, making money to support our family so that we can live healthy lifestyles. Social and community context, that environment that we live in. Health and health care is still a part of our, our health, but it's not the only piece. Uh, but the neighborhood and built environment um, are our streets walkable? Can we um, can we get outside and not feel un, uh, uh, insecure about crime or, or those kinds of things? We we think about health in such a much bigger framework than we did say two decades ago. And extension has a key role to play um, in in helping work across these areas. Next slide, please. Want to. Dial, dial back a little bit to our history, but I want I wanted to first set that stage for you on kind of how extension fits into this co broader conversation about health. But to go back and remind you about what you heard yesterday from Dr. Shelnut, I um, would would love to um, uh, for, for you to just kind of recall this this journey that we've been on um, as a country in this land grant system that even early in the 1800s. Uh, there was this need for agricultural education. Um, there was an effort in 1857 by uh, by, by Senator Morrill to uh, uh, to set up stand up a land grant university system. And fast forward to 1862, we're in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, was able to make it happening happen by adding on uh, milita a military mission to this idea of the land grant university system that would uh, uh, give grant federal lands to individuals and uh, excuse me to, to states to stand up uh, a university with a focus on agricultural mission fast forward 1890 our historically black colleges and universities were brought into that mix um, stepping back a, a couple years to 1887 uh, there was a, a, a bill that established the research mission. So if you're driving through Mississippi or through Florida or through your through Alabama, 
um, and you see a, a sign on the side of the road that says um, you know, Auburn University or ACES Experiment Station or Mississippi State University Experiment Station, um, Florida, University of Florida, Exper IFAS Experiment Station. That is part of our, that is the land grant university at work um, doing research on the agricultural mission of the university um, out in the different areas of the state. So what happened between um, this early 1800s is kind of recognition that we needed we needed a land grant university system to it actually being founded to the research mission, recognition that so much work was happening on the campuses and out at these experiment stations, but it wasn't necessarily making its way out to the communities. Um, and so organically, these these uh, efforts started emerging where the university was was uh, developing what would become the the extension service. And so in 1914, the recognition that that work was very effective translating this education, uh, this research that was happening uh, through the land grant university system to the to the communities, we were able to stand up with uh, the Smith Lever Act, the the extension service formally stand up this this extension service and that that formalized the extension service mission of our land grant university system. Um, it is also important to note that in 1994, tribal colleges and universities were given land grant status. They weren't actually given the land, but they were brought into this mission and given uh, recognition that they they needed to benefit from the uh, resources that are that come with this system. So next slide. Um, when we think about extension specifically, and that's who I'm here representing, uh, always broadly representing the land grant university system, but specifically today, extension. Um, we we think about our work in, in terms of a three-legged stool, and I know Dr. Shelnut mentioned this as well. Um, that that stems from the the idea that we get funding from the federal government via USDA through our state government, through our, our university uh, level allocations, money for allocations to the university, and then counties pitch in. So you might have seen signs that say cooperative extension service. You might remember us as the cooperative extension service. A lot of states have dropped that cooperative name, but that's still in our federal charter and still still is a part of who we are. We cooperate across these levels of government um, to do this work in Mississippi. Our county off, our county governments su supply the space where our extension agents work every day um, and make varying degrees of financial investment in the um, in the uh, the work that those extension agents do. The the three legged stool analogy can also refer to our tripartite mission of of uh, teaching research and extension. So really, if you take any one of those away, uh, either the funding or the mission areas, we're really not the same anymore. We, we become a different beast altogether. So we we, we all with those fit together like hand in glove. On the right side, you'll see a map that demonstrates for you uh, that we do, in fact, have land grant universities in every state um, in Mississippi. Our tribal colleges and universities are, tip, are, are up um, in, in Montana and uh, kind of more of the, the central part of the country, northern central part of the country. You'll also see those 1890 schools are from really about Delaware over to Missouri and down. So the southern states have typically got these HBCUs that are also land grant universities. Um, and you can, uh, if, you, if you move out of state or re-station re somewhere else, you'll be able to find a land grant university and an extension service uh, near you to help with some of the things that I'll talk about here in just a bit. Next slide. Um, in Mississippi, uh, we have offices in every county. I mentioned that we are uh, headquartered, of course, out of our main campus in Starkville, Mississippi, which is where I work. I'm sitting today in Starkville, not on campus, as I mentioned earlier, but um, but but here in Starkville. And uh, we have five centers and institutes as part of our extension service. Um, we are um, we have those those regional experiment stations or, or we call them research and extension centers um, in Mississippi. Uh, we have a lot, 11 satellite stations, and again, we have 82 county offices. That map on the right uh, demonstrates for you where uh, in the counties those offices are based, and we invite you, if you're in Mississippi, to reach out to any of those. I'll give you contact information here in just a bit. Next slide. So our work uh, spans five major program areas. We wor do work across agriculture, natural resources, community resource development, 4-H youth development, and family and consumer sciences. Um, I know that the focus of the conversation these last three days uh, has been around food security and access to food and uh, enhancing people's um, ability to, uh, to to connect with food in a healthy, um, 
in a healthy way. And so I will attempt to make connections between all of these mission areas and our and our food uh, sources here uh, as we move through them. I want to give you some examples and some stories about how we are doing that in extension. Next slide. On the agriculture front, um, we do work from row crops to backyard gardens, um, from uh, large animal uh, agriculture to 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 small animal ruminants and 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 uh, show animals. This is a photograph from a, um, a member of a master gardener club in South Mississippi. is a retired pharmacist. began having problems with his legs. was not able to. Uh, continue in his, in his work so he retired uh, plugged into mass the master gardener program which is one of our agriculture horticulture uh, programs and you see him um, uh, maybe just vaguely but his left hand holding a cane uh, because again he, he had leg challenges with the legs from a career of standing all day every day he's standing at a salad table a raised bed salad table um, and I'll see somebody put in the in the chats pharmacist. Yes, he is a he is now a farm assist. I love that. Um, he um, is is benefiting from our our agricultural mission, but he's also able to grow food in his own backyard and give back as part of uh, uh, his service through Master Gardeners. While he's not able to uh, to to stand independently and work as a, far, a pharmacist, P H A R M A. CIST does work uh, in a very micro level with farms and again produces some of his own food in his own backyard. Those of you that are interested in backyard gardening and small scale farms, Extension is here to help. We can connect you uh, with with uh, Extension agents who can give you advice on how to get those gardens going and help you identify bugs and pests and um, best practices uh, for growing some of your own food. So next slide. I mentioned that we do uh, work across small scale and, and large scale agricultural efforts. This is a photograph from a family in South Mississippi who works to convert their row crop farm. So row crops are farms that you might drive through a large agricultural area and see rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of, of maybe uh, soybeans or cotton or far, uh, corn or milo, wheat. Um, and and uh, um, those are highly productive in many respects. Some folks, uh, uh, identified they may want to make a, a shift from that and so extension is here to help families like this one make that shift and they have put in uh, um, greenhouse uh, tomatoes and so they grow and distribute these tomatoes across the region again very uh, closely connected to our food supply and food access they do make those available locally but they also box those and send them around the around the region extension again very involved in supporting our food supply and food access next slide Uh, this is not explicitly food related, but it, it does have to do with health and well-being. And this is a story about a gentleman who was a, um, a, a retired as a, a coach, um, kind of floated around Mississippi in different coaching roles. And he acquired land um, throughout his career, was very uh, interested in, in uh, conservation, is very interested in conservation and, and uh, leaned on extension for expertise and help with uh, forestry related questions and extension has been there for him, helped him uh, navigate this question. I, I think that our natural resources in Mississippi and really Alabama, Florida as well, all um, benefit so much from, we benefit from our natural resources and, and our, our health is impacted by our natural resources. It's one of the uh, environments where particularly men, uh, women as well, but in particular men uh, go for physical activity. They go hiking through the woods, getting ready for deer season and hunting and setting up their deer stands and 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 while we may not uh, get out and pay, pound the pavement uh, prepping for a 5k we in our deep south states love to engage with our our natural environment and get out and and uh, maybe improve our health a bit in that way <laughs> next slide Uh, now, this does, in fact, have a very direct relationship with our food supply, food security related issues. Wild hogs are a, a major crisis uh, in Mississippi and uh, in agriculture. Of course, we don't hear in terms of the, the, the language of crisis. We don't hear that except in, in uh, terms of pandemic right now. But uh, if you've tuned in to any kind of farm uh, education uh, in the last five years or so, you've heard about our wild hogs. 
they are aggressive. Uh, they are mean. So if a human comes in contact with them in their natural environment, they will uh, come at you. They also will destroy crops and have been a major threat to uh, farms in, in Mississippi and across the southeast. We're working very closely with farmers and uh, have a have swine specialists and and farm specialists that are engaged in addressing this wild hog problem. So those of you that probably not many of you on the call that have got issues with wild hogs, but just want you to know that uh, this is the kind of work behind the scenes that um, often goes <laughs> unnoticed, but that we are engaged in uh, to help ensure a safe, healthy, and affordable food supply for for everyone. Next slide. So our work is not um, not just in again not just in agriculture and natural resources. We also do community resource development, direct education with folks around the state. This is a photograph showing a uh, uh, an interaction between one of our extension specialists and a a local member of a community learning um, how to use a laptop. A lot of folks in rural areas of our state don't have access to <coughs> broadband, don't have access to technology, and we are able to um, uh, provide. A resource uh, for them in terms of education, technology education. Um, we will go into communities and do bring in a fleet of a fleet of laptops, do that that technology education, and get people up to speed on how to use those. Um, how does that connect to food, right? So there are a lot of folks in in uh, communities that need access to sign up for SNAP benefits or for other um, resources that can help them through difficult times, and extension is there to help either guide people through maybe the sign up process, but also give them access to technology and educational, how to use the technology <coughs> to do just that. Next slide. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Bies. Yes, please. Uh, this is Ron. I, uh, you're putting out such great information. I, I just want to ask the audience, everybody that's watching right now, um, let's get a question or, or share some experience. Uh, with extensions, but can somebody raise their hand right now? Let's let's take advantage of what we've heard so far that maybe Dr. Bies can can address, uh, and and you can put it in the chat box. Uh, it looks like uh, Dr. Bies, people are grateful for your great information, but I want to make sure that we have some interaction here. So, is there anybody that has a question for Dr. Bies before he continues on? Don't be shy. Go ahead, raise your hand. Put something in the chat box. I'm going to give you three seconds. Three, two, one. Well, Dr. Bies, let's just keep going. I, I'm trying to pull out right. some questions, uh, but you're doing great. Thank you. Well, please interrupt me at any point. I'm happy to engage uh, now or or later. You'll have my email address and can can reach out to me at any point. But uh, slide here showing our interaction with local rural water systems and water safety, major uh, major uh, factor in the health and well being uh, health outcomes of people. And I just want you to know that we are um, we work with rural water systems around the state and with wastewater um, certified wastewater folks as well to ensure again that we have safe, uh, affordable, accessible, clean water for for our drinking. Next slide. You can carry on. Yeah, and so we do work uh, again on community community resource development, not just uh, the here and now, but looking into the future. We are uh, very committed to helping train uh, future physicians and we are, are connecting our youth with opportunities to learn about medicine and healthcare. And we train and work with them around, uh, we, we work closely with them, uh, these youth understanding food systems and food connections, uh, connections to how food's produced and how they can access it if they are in a period of food insecurity. So I uh, uh, want our, our, our future physicians to understand that and our youth that are participating in this program to understand it, not just for the future, but for the here and now. And, uh, and so, so we do that, we make those connections this is a photograph of a student who came through our program and ultimately matriculated through to medical school at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Um, he, he came to us in, uh, uh, as a rising high school senior. And then this is uh, five years later when he's going into his freshman medical school class. Next slide. We work with youth, our 4-H youth development program, all about building youth. And we use different projects to help uh, with positive youth development, we want them to understand 
that there are people outside of their own family who uh, know love and are concerned about them and their well-being, their 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 development as people. One of the ways that we do that um, in extension is with our Junior Master Wellness Volunteer Program. These are photographs from a school in Sunflower County, Mississippi, uh, with youth that were uh, connected to Junior Master Wellness Volunteers in consort, which is a 4-H extension program, in consort with their high school um, health sciences class in career and technical education. Again, um, always connecting the dots for these folks with food extension is about uh, human development, it is, but it is about agriculture, and that's our roots, and we always want people to connect the dots between whatever they're doing and the food that they're eating, and so we make that a part of this education with our youth, and if the, there are those of you out there who are interested in Junior Master Wellness Volunteers and getting that connected um, in, in your local communities for, for children of your own or for schools that your children are in, I would love to talk with you about that. Next slide. Yeah. Hey, uh, Dr. Bice, yeah. we've, we've yes, got please. a hand raised from Lynn Schultz. Lynn, what hey, have Dr. you got? Thank you, Ron. This has been some great information, but I just want to interject here before you move on to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to, to ask, I know that the 4-H here in Florida um, has quite a bit of virtual programs now since, you know, the, the climate of COVID has been the way it's been. Are those programs offered virtually in Mississippi as well? I mean, I know you can you can host or launch a virtual program from anywhere in the nation now, um, and everybody across the nation can join. But is that the case? Is it state by state? And are there virtual programs for our youth, military youth, or that any youth can get involved in through the 4-H? That was my question. Thank yes, you. Yes, Thanks. Thanks for asking. And absolutely. We are making programs available. Historically, we've been very much uh, in person, but we have we have pivoted to offer opportunities online, uh, Zoom meetings, Teams meetings. Um, and a lot of we do a lot of uh, uh, pickup packets, I think, is what our extension agents are calling them to go kits where we will package a project um, typically in a brown bag, like a brown grocery sack. There'll be a drive through at the extension office. Folks will come uh, come get that and they'll be able to do the project, the program uh, in their home and then circle back with the extension office. So they they vary county by county. Our extension agents have a lot of autonomy and uh, which is a good thing because that means they're able to tailor the needs uh, to their local population, their local their local uh, stakeholders and um I would encourage our folks to reach out to their local extension agent, which again, I'll have contact information or ways that you can get that contact information at the end. Um, I will I will also say that our extension agents, uh, you know, when, when when times were different and in the future, when times will be different and they are more mobile and, and able to go out, they, they would be glad to come to uh, to, to your base, um, to, to where you may be housed. I know that Keesler, um, at Keesler Air Force Base, um, uh, the, the base in um, Columbus, Columbus Air Force Base, uh, Camp Shelby in, in Hattiesburg, uh, other, other places where there may be stations uh, for, uh, for our military members. Our extension agents in those communities will gladly work with them, uh, with, with folks to come and do programming on their base. So it's about making that connection and uh, they're, they're here for you. We're here for you. Yeah. Hey, uh, Dr. Bice, we've got another yeah. hand raised uh, from yeah, Megan. Please. Megan, thank you. If you would unmute and share your information or your question. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Megan. I actually grew up in Gainesville and didn't know about the extension office. I wanted to ask, do you have, do they, do you have marketing materials that have like healthy, how do you eat, you know, like the, the chart for the plate and those kind of kits available for some of the kids that, it, you know, for our military kids to do or to have? We do. Uh, again, that would be something I, I would encourage you to access via the local office. Our, our local agents are very passionate about maintaining that local connection. I mean, we can send stuff out from the state level, but our, our ex local agents are able to help connect the dots more on what local resources are available. We in Mississippi, our SNAP-Ed program in Mississippi, Dr. Shelnut, yesterday's uh, presentation, Dr. Shelnut was uh, is the is the snap ed director for florida implement air implementing agency we have a snap ed program here in mississippi and the kind of brand for that is happy healthy um and okay. and have a lot of resources through our happy healthy um effort as well as general extension um, but yes we do have marketing materials that that address that those issues okay those thank you so much yeah so hey you. dr buys uh, do yes, extensions please. do extensions have funding equally applied from local state and federal sources 
They're not equally applied, no. Uh, the bulk of our funding does come from uh, state state dollars. Um, our federal allocation is not, it, no, it's not a third, a third, a third. Um, and, our, and our county contributions vary from county to county. Um, as you can imagine, there are some real high poverty counties in, in the state that uh, don't have much to give beyond the space where our agents work. And then we've got other counties uh, on the higher end who, you know, pay for one, one and a half, two FTEs, two people, um, up, you know, for salary and then travel expenses and programmatic expenses along with the space and have really nice uh, buildings. So it, it varies. Okay, great. Thank you. The, the slide that you see before you now is a, a slide, a story from Holmes County, Mississippi, uh, with a group of ladies that Extension has, has worked with and sponsored uh, around quilting. And so our, our roots in family consumer sciences are what used to be home economics. Uh, we do a lot of work with textiles and sewing and quilting and and folks say, well, how's that connected to health? What the heck? Why are you, you know, it, and and I look, my, my background, my training is in sociology and public health. What I see when I look at this picture, I see a group of ladies um, who, who care for each other. I look at the quilt. I think about the time that they put into putting that quilt together to getting together, uh, putting it in, quilting it. The conversation that happens around that quilt, man, if you could be a fly on the wall of the room where that quilt was made, the stories that you would hear, the social support. Social support is so important for our health and well-being. Um, and, and just even for you all being here today and the social support that you get from talking to each other in a context like this matters for our health and well-being. So Extension, while not all of our programs are explicitly health related, do contribute to social support, social connections, that feeling of um, uh, of, of that tie that we have to other people in our communities. And so I'm very proud of this work. And again, uh, even though not explicitly um, connected to health, it, it, it is uh, implicitly related to health. Next slide. Uh, now, this is one that's very, con very closely connected uh, to food. This is a story about a lady who moved from South Louisiana uh, after Hurricane Katrina. She started making uh, some of her hometown meals, some of her original foods that, from South Louisiana, uh, freezing them, putting them in a uh, freezer box that she probably got from Lowe's in a, in a flea market place. Somebody from USDA or FDA happened to be strolling through, saw that, recognized that that was not food safe, not approved, uh, not an appropriate way to, to sell food. And they let her know that that was not permissible, but they didn't just come at her and shake their finger and shame on you and here's your fine for this. They connected her with Extension and Extension helped her develop this into a business. Now she is, um, uh, she still does some of her food prep in Mississippi in this formal kitchen that you can see over here to the right. Um, but she also has significant co-packers and a co-packer is a company that might produce this food in a large factory somewhere else using her recipes and is distributed widely through Kroger. So this is a major success story uh, in terms of this woman's innovation, extensions, contributions to this. Um, food, again, very closely related to food, but also economic development. Uh, helped her stand up a business uh, that has now grown and has been very successful. Next slide. Just um, to, to close out for you and, and let you know that our um, mission, our, our promise is that we provide practical education you can trust to help people, businesses, and communities solve problems, develop skills, and build a better future. And I mentioned uh, all along that I'd give you information on how to access your local extension agent. Jot this down, extension.msstate.edu. Go to that website, you'll find a, 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 you'll be able to search on the county uh, where you live and uh, identify uh, the the agent there, but next uh, and the final slide that I have has my contact information on it, and I am very happy uh, to help put you in touch with folks. So feel free to follow me on social media, contact me that way. I'm on Twitter at drbuys, or you can email me at david.buys at msstate.edu, uh, and would love to connect you and your youth um, uh, to 4-H programs or you personally to some of our nutrition programs, ag programs. However, we can uh, we can help. We're here to do that. Um, we're we're for you and with you, uh, literally with you in the communities where you live and, and want to help connect you to resources to make you the best you can be. Thanks for your service. Thanks for those of you who are family members who will spend the holidays 
um, without your loved ones close by. I know that's not hard and not easy. That's quite, quite difficult. And it's not lost on me what a sacrifice you make as, as a family member. So thank you for being here and for giving me the chance to, to speak and join you. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Boys. But please don't leave yet. Let's just do, do we have any questions? This is your last chance. Raise your hand. Let's get involved. Let's get engaged. Um, anybody? By the way, uh, Dr. Boys, I was a little disappointed that I didn't see your children or your son come running into the room. That would have been kind of an added attraction. My four-year-old did make her way in, but she was out. She was out of camera view. I'm glad that I'm glad that I didn't appear too distracted. You, you didn't pick up on the fact that she was in here. No, but but you did great. Everybody feels you, you've given us great information. So thank you so much for for being with us today and being so knowledgeable and skillful and being a great resource for the group. Everybody, let's 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 give a round of applause for, for, for <laughs> Dr. Bison. Hey, hey. and, and what I want to do now is I want to I, I want to bring back uh, Lynn Schultz, who's the uh, well, we know she's with uh, building healthy military communities. Uh, Lynn, uh, uh, I, you got the fire still going at home and can you come back in and keep us moving along? Of course I have it going. Y'all see that right there? Now that's a Florida fire. Now I do have a fireplace <laughs> that in the event it does get a little chilly, I can warm my hands on, but you know, in front of, but anyway, <laughs> today's not that day. I think it's kind of warmed up to maybe uh, upper 60s, low 70s. It's absolutely gorgeous today. I hate to rub it in for anybody who's not having that wonderful weather, but that's why I live in Florida. So anyway, th Ron, thank you so much. And Dr. Bice, that was amazing information. I love our extension services, um, especially in Florida. And so it sounds to me like y'all are just as amazing there in Mississippi as you are here in Florida. So I get, I have the most wonderful pleasure to introduce our next uh, presenter. Now, again, remember, this is interactive, so please interact because this is the time for you to ask questions. But our next presenter has got some amazing, an amazing new program that they have launched here in the Northeast Florida area. And, and really, Mike, I think it's going to end up being all over the state eventually and, and even outside of Florida. But let's go ahead and let me give you his uh, tell you who our next presenter is. Mike O'Brien is a 28 year career in the health and wellness industry. The majority of those years um, was a, as a VP of the YMCA of the Florida's First Coast. We love our Florida First Coast YMCA. So let me give you um, some details of some of his interaction. In May of 2013, he accepted the chief executive position for the Greater Jacksonville Area USO. Um, I got to be introduced to him once um, I came on as Building Healthy Military Communities in 2016. Um, so in 19, the Greater Jacksonville USO had over 100,000 interactions with our military and their family members. 1,600 plus care packages distributed to deployed active duty members in 2019. Um, in 2019, they distributed over 8,300 free Jacksonville Jaguar tickets to our active military. You know, our poor Jags. But, you know, whatever. I mean, hey, it still is football. We, we like it. You can get a hot dog and stuff. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a good time. <laughs> then um, we uh, provided thousands of concert tickets um, and theater shows to our military in 19. Um, now we do a lot of virtual stuff, of course, but provided free use of 26 computers at three different USO locations um, and the JU USO satellite location. 26 computers. That's awesome. 15,000 plus military and family members attended the four military appreciation events in 2019. 19,967 volunteer service hours coordinated in support of the Jacksonville USO operations. Listen, this is a busy organization. I'm just, I want to read this to you for you to get a handle on the impact the USO has here in our Northeast Florida area. They opened the USO Pathfinder Transition Center, which helps those transitioning out to find that job that is for their next career step and in the avenue that helps them go in the right direction as they are transitioning out of military service into the civilian population. 
But so at the NAS Jack summer of 2018, that's when they opened that and launched that program that has assisted over a thousand transitioning military and military spouses find great second careers. That's huge. That's huge. That that impacts what we're talking about some this week and financial readiness and how can we make sure that we um, provide opportunities for our military or at least give them that well to fish from. This is what that program, the USO Pathfinders, helps them do. Establish the USO Healthy Military Families. That's what he's going to be talking about today. But they established that program assisting young enlisted families with up to $250 a month of fresh fruit and vegetables, lean meats, and dry goods. Took ownership of the USO Armed Forces Half Marathon and Freedom 5K. That was formerly the Marine Corps Half Marathon and Freedom 5K. Balanced the $1.5 million budget. 100% locally funded because we love our military in Northeast Florida. And I'm, uh, he is honored to serve those local heroes and their families. Let me tell you a little bit of personal stuff real quick. He was born and raised on Long Island, New York, and we won't hold that against him at all. His second oldest of seven children, he's married to Carolyn, and she's put up with him for since May of 1982. He's got twin twin sons, Colin, who's an account manager in San Francisco, and KC, nurse, and KC, nurse for the Mayo Clinic, uh, Jacksonville, yes, and graduated from the University of Delaware in 1980 with a BS in business, loves running, he's very active, biking, fitness in general, qualified for and completed the Boston Marathon in 14 and 16. I think that's all I can say. Mike, you've got to take it away from here because, I, I mean, your list just goes on and on, and we're so blessed to have you today. I can't wait to hear more about the, the Healthy Families Initiative. Take it away. Thanks, Lynn, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for that nice bio. Uh, it just tells everyone that I'm, I'm pretty old. <laughs> I've been around a little while, but uh, just honored to be here. And, and just a Real quickly about my uh, USO career, the last seven and a half years, um, I did not serve. I, I tried many, many years ago to go through OCS a couple of years out of college. Um, there wasn't an opening and I moved on with my career and I always had this void, felt uh, this void in my life. And then uh, about eight years ago, I got a call almost eight years ago from a dear friend, a retired naval aviator um, that was on the board. And uh, I'll just say this, it's been the honor of my 40 year professional career to uh, to lead this organization here in North Florida, to touch our military, to all those that are on the call that are, that are serving now, that have served their or their their family members have served. Uh, thank you for your service, truly. And uh, from the bottom of my heart and our heart from the USO. Um, I pinch myself that seven and a half years later, I still have this privilege to lead this great organization. And so thank you for having me today. I'm excited. It's been really a great three days. I just want to applaud um, Lynn and Ron and uh, Lieutenant Chambers and all those that have been involved in, in putting this assembly on. I want to especially thank all the, uh, the, the speakers. Just great, great information. I look forward to partnering with many, if not all of you uh, going forward or your affiliates here in the state of Florida. But uh, I congratulate you all. And um, this these last three days, you know, um, trying to help the military families improve their health and wellness and, and financial security. What a very noble and worthy mission. So well done to everybody. And for all those that have called in, um, it's a great, great mission. And uh, we at the USO are honored to be a part of this uh, this assembly this week. So uh, LT, we can go to the uh, I think the first um, the first slide. I don't have a lot of slides, so uh, I think seven or eight. Um, so like Lynn said, uh, I met her about four years ago and she's been a great, great friend. Um, what Lynn did uh, four years ago was introduced uh, to me a gentleman by the name of Paul Sapia. Now, Paul is the state representative, Florida state representative, you know, for the uh, Bold Goal Initiative for Humana Inc. Uh, I had invited Paul about three, three and a half years ago to come out to a USO no-do dinner. You'll see a slide here in a moment uh, and uh, to to uh, witness what no-do dinner is all about. <clears throat> well, um, after coming out to the no-do dinner, uh, Paul and I sat down and there it is. There's the picture. 
That's actually only one third of our Mayport USO. There's two other sections about the same size. Um, no Dough Dinner is simply a free home cooked meal for a young enlisted and all their children. So every other Monday, um, we have this um, wonderful gathering, right? Um, the free meal is nice, um, but really what it's all about is, is the fellowship, the camaraderie, uh, the, um, the support. And I like to call the No Dough Dinners Thanksgiving every other Monday at the Mayport USO. So Paul and I wanted to come up with an idea, how can we address, further address, food insecurity within our, within our military community? And that's where we came up with the idea after about one year of, um, of meetings and discussions with multiple partners and, and uh, folks supporting us, we came up with this, uh, this idea of the Healthy Military Families Initiative. So at these no dough dinners, we're doing three to 400 meals, believe it or not, in a two hour period. Like I said, every other Monday. Next slide, please, LT. Hey, so, Mike. Mike, yeah. uh, just a quick question actually comes from LT. Sure. Has COVID impacted oh, the yeah. no dough dinners? Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's perfect uh, segue right now. So, uh, I'll get to that in just one moment, LT. It has dramatically impacted it, uh, the program, in several ways. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to September uh, 2018. That's when, after about a year of planning with multiple partners, including uh, Paul and, and several others in the community, uh, we finally were ready to, to, to take off with our first pilot. September 18, we had 50 vetted families. These were vetted by the, the chaplain's office uh, or the senior enlisted of the, the regional commands. Young enlisted E3 through E5 that really could use the help addressing food insecurity. And so uh, what you're looking at right here is actually our, our distribution setup. To the LT's question, when uh, back in 2019, we were bringing in uh, 60 to 70 families into the center and they would basically go grocery shopping. Well, COVID dramatically changed that. With COVID, we had to, of course, safety first. So we had to go about changing how we delivered the program. So what you're seeing uh, is the Mayport Center and the setup. It's actually a three day program. On Tuesday, we receive our, our food and dry goods. On Wednesday, uh, so it's all set up on Tuesday. On Wednesday is the distribution date. And on Thursday, it's the breakdown and, and reset of the Mayport USO. But the military families never get out of their car. They literally drive up at their, their assigned time, for call in, and then the staff and volunteers uh, will load up their fresh fruits, vegetables, lean meats, and dry goods, and literally place it in their car. The other impact, uh, Lieutenant, where it really had a um, dramatic impact was, and this was mentioned, several speakers had, had addressed this. Many of our, our spouses of our military lost jobs due to COVID. You know, the, the, the restaurant they were working at or the retail shop closed. In some cases, it's still closed. Um, our National Guard, you know, they lost, many of them have lost income uh, due to their day jobs no longer being there or are severely underemployed. So we saw that the need uh, for this program really escalated. So it's a very appropriate question, but I couldn't be more proud of the staff and volunteers. It takes a, a small little army to put this program together. As you can just see, it's a tremendous amount of labor. Um, but we've gone from 2019 where we went to 70 families. Uh, this year, we escalated up with some financial support from multiple agencies and organizations to 140, thank you, LT, to 140 families. And I don't wanna get all caught up on the number of people, military families that were, that were serving, but this, this chart does a good job talking about uh, how many people we're touching now on a monthly basis. Our USO, however, is really at a capacity. Um, again, referencing the, the earlier slide with, with all the, uh, the food items throughout the entire Mayport USO, we cannot 
go any further than where we're at with 100 vetted families twice a month now. That was the upgrade this year. We went from once a month of receiving anywhere from 150 to $200 worth of value of fresh fruits, vegetables, lean meats, and dry goods um, to uh, twice a month. So you're talking about 300 to to four hundred dollars for an E3, an E4 with multiple children. That has a dramatic impact on on, on their financial situation. They can take that three or four hundred dollars a month and possibly apply it to a better uh, family vehicle uh, or or possibly a um, a better housing situation you know, for the family or maybe a trip to Disney World that they can never afford before. So it truly is making a dramatic impact to our to our military families. But we are at capacity. However, there's good news. In the beginning of this year, we started working on really building this program out um, to scale. We know that our our data has shown that there's not 140 families that would qualify for this program, but five, 600 or 700 families just in the North Florida region, South Georgia region, Kings Bay included. And so how are we going to do that? So we started designing and planning uh, an expansion, the Healthy Military uh, Families Building. And what you see here is just some of the elevations, uh, the elevation um, the east elevation is actually the front entrance to the facility. You see the, the northern elevation will be able to, to roll in pallets of inventory of food and dry goods and store them so we can take this program from 70 to 140 families up to several hundred in the very near wow. future. And we're really, really excited about what that could bring to us. So we're, we're designing this 2,400 square foot facility. Next slide, uh, LT. And you'll see a, a good uh, front entrance in the forefront. The actual picnic tables are currently there and the awning is currently at our Mayport USO. You go through that area and that'll be the entrance. That'll be the grocery store shopping experience that our military men and women you know, will have. And this will allow us to go where we're currently at capacity to that four or five hundred or even greater number of families every month coming through to the USO twice a month again. So very, very powerful, huge economic impact to, the, to their 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 uh, their budgets, et cetera. So we're excited. We're, we're hoping to start construction Q2 2021, and uh, it's going to be pretty special, really excuse, unique. Yeah, excuse me, Mike. Uh, yes, sir. We, ha we, we have a hand up, please. And, and I'm not clear who it is, but if it's you, would you please unmute? and share your comments. Oh, it's Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I just had to speak up because, you know, working with Mike um, at this place that I, you know, have, and, you know, we, we kind of enter cross paths periodically, but, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, and I'm sure he might be getting at this here, so I don't want to steal a thunder, but, you know, one of the things that even from the very beginning, Ron, when we, we had our fin uh, personal financial counselor in on our first day on Tuesday and, and, you know, I just want to kind of in, put this out there. When you go to a financial counselor and you have a dollar left and they're going to try to tell you how to spend that extra dollar that you have left after paying your bills, that doesn't go very far. So it's a little bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. But what happens whenever you can actually help a family put 200 to $400 back into their pocket at the end of the month. And then you sit them down with the financial counselor. The importance of that connection at that point will be one of those of teaching them to fish, not just giving them fish. And that's something that we had that's talked right. about. Um, Mike O'Brien, Mr. O'Brien and I have talked about many times um, was that, you know, hey, this opportunity not only helps feed these families, but now what it does is it gives them a, a tool, whether it be the, those funds back mm. in their pocket, to then get in front of a financial counselor uh, through the military or, you know, through their local resources in the community. We have financial counseling with the Department of Health. The Cooperative Extension offers financial counseling, and that is all free. Um, so, so here we have all of that opportunity to get them in front of a financial counselor once the food is squared 
squared away. And then that extra 200 to 400 a month can go to help pay off debt, to get them in a better place financially to where they're not scraping. Um, Mike, I mean, I, I just, I had to interject that because I just, it excites me so much when I think about the potential that we have with the wonderful partners. It's just really, a, it's just really great opportunity. <laughs> well, thanks, Lynn, and, and, and you're going to see some more. Go back a couple of slides, uh, LT, if you don't mind. I want to go back to the front the front entrance of, of the uh, the USO uh, Healthy Military Family Center. Okay. One more back, and uh, yeah. So I, I just want to say, you know, we all know, especially our military folks and, and those that are retired or have served before, what a proud people, right, our military. They defend our freedoms of our, our nation. Typically, they are not going to go you know, to a community uh, food bank. Um, they're embarrassed. And, and the last thing we ever want our military to do is, is to be embarrassed in any way. But this program has proven to work because it's the USO, their home away from home. For 80 years, the USO has been always been by their side. So when they come to the USO, it's a whole different mentality. Their dignity is certainly maintained. So next, uh, next slide, LT. <clears throat> and we can, uh, we can, no, the uh, the video, um, have that short video. Is that still there? It's not yep. working. A little, t it doesn't work, LT. LT. Okay, we just had a short testimonial, but we could get dozens, if not hundreds, of <clears throat> families to give testimonials, and we do have many of them available. But uh, no problem at all. Now to Lynn's point, and, and this is really the crux of this program, and, and she stole a little bit of my thunder, but I uh, love Lynn, and uh, we've been uh, close partners now for four years. But this is way more than just a, a food program and food insecurity program. That's that's important, right, and it helps greatly, but this is a health and wellness program. This is an educational program, right? So by all means, we're going to be tying into our financial partners on the financial literacy and the financial security matter of a, of a military family. That will be a huge program <clears throat> and seminars going out with this program forward. The American Heart Association has lined up as a partner and they're going to be doing blood pressure checks and they're going to be providing healthy heart menus. Um, They've also provided some financial support, uh, the ability for us to add two water filling stations, both one in the existing building and one in the new uh, new building, as well as some holiday uh, extra dollars to support our <coughs> holiday meals program. Tobacco Free Florida will be doing uh, you know uh, seminars here at our, our USO. The YMCA, where I retired uh, almost eight years ago, they have a program called Operation Strong and Ready. Uh, and this is really exciting. It's an eight week program where uh, the military twice a week are led by certified trainers. And um, there, there's no charge for the military families. And they um, they provide this uh, th this training virtually come January, uh, about mid January. We're going to tie that uh, virtual training into our Healthy Military Families Initiative. Um, their training is based on the, the Army combat fitness test. Many soldiers were having struggles passing the minimum standards. We're going to incorporate that program into the USO Healthy Military <clears throat> Family Program. Culinary schools. You know, Lynn already stole some of that thunder. You know, give a man a fish, he eats a day. Well, we're going to teach a young 22, 23-year-old what to do with an eggplant. Hey, I'm a lot older than that. I don't know how to cook an eggplant. So, uh, and we're also going to make it fun. USO entertaining the troops for 80 plus years now. Um, we're going to bring on our celebrity chefs, both local, which we've been doing for many months now, as well as some of our national celebrity chefs. Uh, celebrity chef uh, Irvine and celebrity chef uh, Art Smith are both uh, potentially um, guest speakers that that'll talk about uh, the USO, their <laughs> love for the military, and how to eat healthy. But be entertained at the same at the same uh, at the same light. So uh, we're excited about the partnerships. Many of those that spoke this week, I expect to be partners with this program. Our USO is small. I only have a total of nine uh, full time staff throughout the region. We lean on and connect with. That's the key mission of the USO. 
great organizations that have the expertise. And so if it's not you, hopefully there'll be an affiliate here in this part of the country that we can align with to provide the education, the health and wellness. And then the final slide, um, LT. And I don't even think Lynn knows about this. No, that truck. I saw the truck there, the uh, refrigerated box truck. Um, just last week, thank you. Um, just last week, last Friday, uh, I got word uh, that our USO has, um, they've been approved for a grant to allow us to purchase uh, a refrigerated box truck. Now, in my eyes, that was, you know, a year down the road. That was phase three. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot sooner. And that's exciting because now we, we can go beyond our 30 or 40 mile radius, safely transport the fresh fruits, vegetables, and the meats to other parts of Florida, other parts of South Georgia, you know, and even beyond ultimately. So we're really excited by that. And, um, and that's really a blessing uh, where we're, where we're going to be, be able to go with uh, such a donation. So uh, I think that's it. Just a QA. and a um, yeah, Mike, uh, we, yes, we do have some, yeah, some comments. Okay, um, okay, now I'm tracking a little bit better now that you're... Okay, got it. Go ahead. Yeah. Nadia, were you saying something? I just wanted to mention something. I've been uh, working with soldiers and family for over 10 years. I transferred from Fort Bragg, actually. Uh, and as anybody who's ever been on Bragg knows that it's a monster base. Um, and the USO has been... Fabulous. I've used them consistently over through the years on Bragg. And when I came here to Florida, they have been phenomenal. They have done events for my soldiers um, during the summer. They give away backpacks for the kids on um, deployments. Um, they will escort our soldiers through the um, airports and, you know, take them to U the USO centers. So, and they come out to our family day events. They provide food, um, face painting, toys, just phenomenal um, organization. And I'm so grateful for all the things they've done for our soldier or family members. So if you are able to utilize um, their services, please do so. Um, do so. So I just wanted to put that out there. I just love them. Awesome. Thank you, Nadia. Yeah, I, I want to ask, uh, I, I noticed in the uh, chat box, uh, Tiffany, Tiffany, if you can hear me, you said this program is so cool. W would you mind sharing what, what's so cool about it? Or what's your experience? Uh, and if I'm not asking too much for you to speak up on it, uh, anybody that knows me, Ron, knows that's not too much to ask for me to speak. <laughs> I Thank just, you. I'm from Minnesota, and I'm the state coordinator uh, for Building Healthy Military Communities, BHMC. And I have never actually seen something quite at this level, and for it to be organized in the fashion that it is. So I am taking some detailed notes over here. We have what well, is called Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, which we have you know, over 80 communities throughout the state. And we try in our individual communities, but the USO, we don't actually have a USO in Minnesota. Right. We have the Armed Forces Service Center, but um, I just, I really love of what you're doing. And for anyone that knows what it takes to put something like this together, kudos to everyone. Uh, especially the USO for organizing this. This is major, and this is definitely a best practice to share. Yeah, Mike, you, you've done a great job, Mike. You've got lots of energy. You've got a passion behind helping. Uh, and, and would you confirm something for me? Sure. I, I noticed you're with the USO of Jacksonville. Yeah. But I understand that if, it, if, the, if, if somebody has a USO logo, and it doesn't have a state below it or a city below it, that monies that are donated go to Washington. Is that correct? Yeah, typically, uh, Ron, that is correct. It would go go through um, Washington. Uh, the headquarters is in Arlington, Virginia. So uh, just recently, matter of fact, there's been a multiple year. I won't go into it. Um, uh, the CEO was, was looking to reorganize the, the organization. It's been a four or five year process. And uh, over the past two years, it really escalated. Right now, there are four regions. Obviously, Jacksonville has merged recently, and we are part of the Southeast region. There's the, there's the Central region in Texas, 
the West region uh, in, in L LA, and then the Midwest region in Chicago. The last region to stand up will be in 2021, the Northeast sector. Uh, so we'll all report to one of those five regions. Um, to to uh, Tiffany, your comments, the Midwest is, we're looking to expand, right? The USO wants to be wherever the military are. And we know they're what we call white areas that aren't being served. And with this reorganization, I think in the near future, it's very, very possible, if not physical facilities, expeditionary support is absolutely available. And uh, I'll be happy to share more information you know, with you offline on that to support your men and women in uniform, the National Guard up in Virgin uh, uh, Minnesota. But uh, that's where we're going right now. And I'll say one last thing uh, about this effort, the Healthy Military Families effort has gotten the attention of our headquarters, has gotten the attention of our regional president in the Southeast. Uh, Hampton Roads, which is a part of the Southeast region, is also um, involved in, in food insecurity matters. We'll be helping and supporting them as they bring up their program. Um, North Carolina U USO with a ton of military, one of the top military states in the in the in the country, right? As as uh, Nadia had mentioned, um, they are also involved in food insecurity uh, programs, and we'll be working with them to help them uh, come up to speed. One day, where we're currently at, and where we hope to go. So <laughs> it is starting to spread. We always felt, even three or four years ago, this had the potential to be a national program, and it'll first start in the southeast, you know, and uh, and then we feel it'll expand to many other areas, hopefully, just like building healthy military communities wants to be in all 50 states, where well, we hope this program can serve our military men and women. You know, And again, remember the health and wellness and the education, that's the core to this program. The food and, and, and the support and the financial support is, is wonderful, but it's really the health and health and wellness and that educational component, including you know, the financial security um, uh, seminars that are coming. Yeah, Mike, uh, we've got a hand up from Kiana. Yeah. Kiana, uh, would you uh, like to unmute and ask Mike your question or share your experience? Kiana? Kiana, are you still there? Oh, okay, S speak a little louder, please. Okay. Um. Hey, Mike. Um, I'm. I'm just. I just want to say I'm fascinated with the work that you have done with the USO, and I just want to know since we're in a pandemic right now, what are some strategies or I guess some things to consider for the future with the USO, the different regions and the operations um, to, I guess, cover as many military base or different locations. Yeah, it, it's a good question, uh, Kiana. So we've had to reimagine, it's not just Jacksonville, all the USOs around the country, around the world for that matter, had to reimagine delivery of our services. You know, we have thousands and thousands of interactions daily with military men and women, their, their spouses and their children. But with COVID, everything changed. Everything had to become, you know, either drive-by or our virtual programming uh, has exploded, both on a local level uh, with my PR and marketing uh, director leading that effort, as well as on the national level, it has exploded. So um, we have had incredible experiences nationwide with our virtual programming and keeping connected, keeping our military men and women and their families mm -hmm. connected is the key and so we've had to shift everything uh, that we've done and uh, but uh, thank God we've been able to do it successfully and uh, and we're still touching the troops uh, as much if not more than we ever have because of technology allowing us to go out and beyond our virtual run half marathon on Saturday we had to do it virtual for safety reasons but we have runners from all over the country that are going to participate in the USO Armed Forces Half Marathon and, and Freedom 5K on Saturday is just another example. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, uh, by the way, another hand just went up. Yeah. Uh, where did it go? Where did the hand go? And if that's you, please be kind enough to unmute and 
Ask Mike a question. <laughs> I was, this is James. I'll let Mike know. I'll do a virtual marathon with him. <laughs> <laughs> a, a virtual marathon. You're going to run 26 miles on Zoom. That's good. It, it, hey, it's Mike. actually going to be Facebook Live, so you can watch. I'm going to run with uh, 12 of the leanest, meanest Marines here in the region. So it's going to be on Facebook Live, the Jacksonville channel, Jax USO. So if you want to watch us, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Hey, Mike, one last question. Would you lift up your tie? I, is that a Christmas tie? It looks kind of neat. Oh, yeah. I got my yeah, festive let's, tie let's on. Let's take a look at – oh, you got – okay, okay. You got your tie on. And I got uh, my Christmas way, tree. The, the hands keep coming. Tree. The hands keep coming, Mike. I, I'm not sure what you've done. I hope we don't miss a cooking demonstration. Uh, Rachel, will you be kind enough to uh, unmute and say something nice? Yes. I didn't hear about the donations we can make to the USO. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our USO is 100% self-supported, so we rely on individual civic groups. Thank you so much for asking. Corporations. I mean, I didn't go into the detail of how many organizations and groups that have been involved in supporting our Healthy Military Families Initiative, but everything uh, is through the generosity of the community and the organization. So jacksuso.org, that's the simplest way, J-A-X-U-S-O.org. You can simply go online uh, and support our effort to bless our military, to bless our military families, and allow us to grow this program even further. So thank you so much for uh, bringing that up. Yes, and um, and of course, they always need volunteers. So please, yep. if, if, if you want to volunteer, you want to donate, that's up to you. But uh, Mike, you've been great. You've done... Um, the USO has done great things. Again, I've had tremendous experience over my career in the military. So thank you for taking the time and a busy time of the year for you to be with us today. And I thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, what I want to, and what I want to do is I want to move in. If she's got any energy left, uh, I want to go to Lynn Schultz, that coordinator from these healthy communities out of Florida. Lynn, bring us back to somewhere. Oh, I have energy because I know what's coming up, Ron. What's coming up now <laughs> is another one of those fantastic partners that we've been able to connect with here in Florida with uh, University of Florida IFAS Extension. And she is out of Orange County. And I'm just so excited to introduce VG to you. So let me give you a little bit of uh, information. She is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and extension agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension. Her primary role is to educate residents of Orange County, Florida on how to lead healthier lives, prevent chronic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, and learn lifestyle yeah, management strategies once diagnosed. So her degrees include a Master of Science in Public Health from Johns Hopkins University and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Maryland. She is a dog lover, just like yours truly. <laughs> and during normal times, an avid traveler who loves to explore cultures and cuisines. And we have been waiting on this. So VG, I am so excited. Sweetie, take it away. Oh, she's in the Hello, kitchen. Everyone. She's in the kitchen. <laughs> I am, and I hope you can hear me okay. Sound coming through? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. And I have I do have some help today. So I have my mom with me. She and I both live here. So she'll be my sous chef today as we're as we're cooking along. So <laughs> oh, that's great. Are you going to be giving us some meals ready to eat? Uh, only well, kidding. Only kidding. If I could ship them virtually, I would. So we are going to make a couple of different things today. And we have been um, working with some magic. So hopefully you'll be able to see over top of what I'm cooking here and you should be able to also see me. So that's what we're going to try to do. And so I think we'll go ahead and start with our slideshow to show you our first recipe. We're going to be making three different recipes in about 25 to 30 minutes. So it's going to be very exciting. And the first thing I want to highlight for you is a white bean chicken chili. So typically when we make chili, we tend to use ground beef. Um, beef tends to be higher in fat than say a chicken breast would. So this would definitely be a lower fat option. When you make a traditional chili, it's usually made with a tomato base. And so for individuals who are looking for something that's less acidic, if they have any problems with heartburn or any kind of 
indigestion if they eat anything very acidic and tomato based this is a great option not to mention that the the added beans will give it extra fiber so i will highlight a few things and and we'll get cooking here too but the the recipe list may look kind of long but it's really not that much stuff your main ingredients are going to be some onions and garlic for flavoring your beans your chicken and your broth and everything else is kind of seasoning there we go so your onions, garlic, your chilies are going to be kind of that flavor base, a whole lot of spices, and you can tweak those to your preference. Then the beans and the chicken and the sour cream will kind of pull it all together. So what we'll do is we will start with, I have a, a skillet here that I'm using so that you can see it. Otherwise, I'd have my back to you on the stovetop. So in this skillet, we're going to put in some diced uh, onions, and that was just one small onion that I diced prior to. So I'll have my mom assist me here um, because we want to get these going. And while those are going for a few minutes, we will talk about some tips and tricks to keep in mind. So we're going to saute those onions until they start to kind of um, look translucent or a little bit more clear and see through. We'll add some garlic and we'll let that simmer for a little bit. So while she's doing that, what you'll see on the screen are some tips. So. What I love about this white bean chicken chili is that a lot of it is made with pantry staples that I just keep on hand. Beans, broth or stock, canned veggies. With any canned goods or packaged goods, they're great, they're handy, and they come in um, when you need them, when you need to make something quick. But you have to watch the sodium. So when these items are processed and prepared, a lot of times they add salt to add flavor and to help preserve it. So that's one thing that I would note is you want to watch the sodium. So what I'll do is we can swap back to the overhead screen. So you may be able to see um, I have a can of beans here and it'll tell you, I hope the video isn't too grainy, your sodium count. So it'll tell you both in milligrams, but it'll also give you a percentage on the right. So over here, if you can read that, that's 9% of your daily sodium in about a half cup of beans. So what does that mean? Well, we're not going to eat the whole can in one sitting when we're making this because we are going to use two cans for the entire preparation and that should give us at least four to six portions depending on how much you serve yourself. But it is something to look out for. Sometimes you can find beans that have no added sodium or low sodium you can also rinse them to kind of get rid of some of that salt. When you're looking at those percentages, one thing I like to use is the 520 rule. If something is 20% or more, it is high in whatever you're looking at. So if this had 20% of sodium per serving, I would say this would be a high sodium food. If it had 5% or less, then I would say it's a low sodium food. So I kind of like to keep those numbers handy when looking at a food label and shopping and watching the sodium is that 520 rule. Five is low, 20 is high. Another thing I wanted to highlight is that you can puree the beans and use that as a thickener. So rather than adding butter and flour to anything that you're trying to thicken, I have added or I have pureed some of the beans that we'll use earlier with some of the broth. So that'll help us thicken our, our chili. I also really like chili because you can add a lot of veggies and hide them. So if you yourself are a picky eater or if you're cooking for a picky eater, you can dice things really small, throw them in there. You can add things like corn, carrots, anything else. Um, if you're making a tomato based one, I like to add sweet potatoes and carrots to that too. And that last tip there is that you can make a big batch and freeze for later. Nobody necessarily wants to cook all day every day. So if you can make a big batch of chili, put them in smaller containers and stick them in the freezer, then you'll be ready to go the next time you have a meal. So we'll swap back to the overhead because these onions are looking great. Thank you, mommy. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start adding in a lot of the flavors. So you see our onions have started to cook down, the garlic has started to cook down, and then we have a number of spices that we'll throw in. So I have here some cumin, and hopefully you can do this with a spatula. So I'm going to add in some cumin. 
And I love cumin. I typically add it to everything. We have some paprika. We'll add that in. I have some oregano going in there. Coriander. And a bit of cayenne pepper. And again, all of these you can add more or less depending on what flavors you like. And notice I'm not adding salt because as I mentioned, a lot of the foods that I'm using are canned. So they're gonna come in with a little bit of salt. As far as heat goes, you can also add, I have some green uh, chilies. These also came in a can. So pretty simple to keep all these spices and cans handy for, your, for when you wanna make a meal. And then last but not least, we'll add the chicken and the beans. So let me get that going in here. And this, I'm using some rotisserie chicken, but really you can have any kind of leftover chicken and throw it in there. You don't have to shred it, you can cube it, you can keep it in big chunks. It's your recipe once you're supposed to make it. So by putting all the seasoning in together, we're gonna kind of let all those flavors meld um, and make sure that they really get around. And then some of our cannellini white beans. Okay. So what else do we have? I have some corn. And this one was also canned corn. You could use frozen or fresh. So it's up to you. Add that in for a bit of color. And once all those are mixed in together, we're going to add our broth. So the original recipe called for two 14-ounce cans. I bought the big container just because if I have extra broth, I might as well just keep it for later. But I'm only going to add in about two cups of the broth um, because I don't want my chili to be too watery. If I wanted to serve it over brown rice, for example, then I might add the whole rest of the container. And if we need more, we can add some too. And last but not least, I am adding the pureed beans and broth. And I also added about a third cup of sour cream um, to the beans and broth. So that's what you're seeing here in this, in this um, container. So we're going to add that in. And then you see as soon as we start to add in the, the mixture, it starts to look creamy. So that's what we want is we want it to end up being kind of like a creamy chicken chili. And again, you can let this just sit and simmer really till it gets warm if you're hungry because everything has been pre-cooked. If you simmer it for about 20 minutes, those flavors will really start to come together. So we're going to turn it up some. Oh, it's that high. Okay. Mm. We're going to turn it up. We're going to let it simmer and we're going to set that aside so we can move on to our next recipe. So I'll take questions while I'm cleaning up here as we move on to the next one, if anybody has any so far. Fiji, uh, this yes. is Ron. Yeah, a lot of people seem to be getting hungry. <laughs> so yes. you're doing a great job. Uh, of course, we, we do have a hand up. Uh, okay. James, uh, go ahead, ask your question. Okay, uh, I love what you're doing here. I'm here to tell you. But Thank you. I like my food real spicy. Okay. The paprika or the cayenne, you can add a little bit more if you wanted a little bit, little bit of a uh, little bit, little kick to it, so to speak. Yes, for sure. So again, all those spices are flavors without any added salt. So that's, that's what we're concerned about typically is wanting to keep the salt to a minimum. So any seasonings and spices, you can tweak them. I, I typically tend to go heavy handed on cumin and garlic because I like those flavors. If you wanted it to be spicier, you can add extra cayenne. You can add another can of the green chili. It really is uh, for you to tweak and, and make your own. Great question, though. Any others well, before we move on? Do, do you know the calorie counts for the chili per serving? I do not know it off the top of my head. I did grab this recipe from a website and then I kind of tweaked it. The, the original website called for cream cheese instead of sour cream, but I used reduced fat sour cream to keep it a little bit lower. Um, so I don't have that unfortunately off the top of my head, but it might be on the website. It would just probably be even fewer calories and less 
less fat. Great. Well, let's let's get into your second recipe. Wow. Please. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a sheet pan roasted chicken, um, sweet potatoes, and broccoli. Y el pollo. Mm -hmm. So um, I love to roast, and honestly, that's usually my go-to between the chili and any kind of roasted veggies because it's something that you can easily set in the oven, set it and forget it, set it and take the dog for a walk, come back and dinner is ready. And you can really do this with almost any vegetable. So when we talk about not knowing what to do with certain vegetables, you could probably roast it, sprinkle some olive oil or, or drizzle some olive oil, sprinkle some seasonings, throw it in the oven and come back and once it's tender, it's done. Um, thankfully veggies, we don't have to worry about food safety in terms of time and temperature, but the chicken we do. So I'll talk about that in a bit, but you're seeing the ingredients on the screen and I have most of them here. I have the veggies, I have my, my tray of seasonings and spices and all that. Um, and we have our chicken. So, yep, thank you for going to that overhead. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get the sweet potatoes in the oven. They are gonna take a bit longer to cook. So I'm gonna drizzle both the sweet potatoes and the broccoli with just a little bit of olive oil. And I am going to season them with salt and pepper. I like freshly ground pepper. I feel it has a bit more flavor than just your um, container bought and it lasts a really long time. And I'm going to also sprinkle a bit of salt and I like to put it on my hand first so that I know that it is really just a pinch. If you just go straight from the container, who knows how much salt you're putting in so we'll do that. And I will kind of just give them a quick toss to coat. And then these are going to go on a sheet pan and in the oven. And I did preheat the oven to 425 so that um, once we got to this point, we could go straight in there. And I'm actually going to add a bit more oil to the broccoli because it seems like it's missing some. So we can get some more for our chicken. Okay, so bajale la candela al chile. So what we're going to do is we're going to place our sweet potatoes on a baking sheet to roast them. And one thing I will highlight is we want to make sure that our sweet potatoes have some space between them. So if I just left them like that and threw them in the oven, they would steam, they wouldn't roast. So by separating them a little bit, we allow the outside to get cooked um, and be a little bit more crisp than if we were to just kind of pile them on there. It would still cook, but it would all be mushy. So we're going to allow it a chance to get kind of crispy on the outside edges. So this was about two sweet potatoes worth, what you're seeing here. And once I have it separated um, just a bit, I'm going to put those in the oven. Or actually, let me. El pescado. All right, so she's helping me with that, and I'm gonna move on next to the chicken. And the chicken here, uh, these were chicken cutlets. I could have just as easily gotten some chicken breasts and sliced them thin, and then I even made these into strips. So really, I took the chicken breast, and I, you could have sliced it in half, I just bought it kind of that way, and then I cut it into about inch thick strips so that they would cook more quickly and evenly. And my chili is really going here, so I'm gonna bring it down to a simmer. Okay, for the chicken, we want to add flavor and I'm gonna top off my olive oil since I used some. But this is going to be about two tablespoons of olive oil that are gonna go in there. Um, I told you I like garlic, so we also have about um, a tablespoon of garlic in here, which is, you know, maybe three cloves or four depending on their size and then I also have some taco seasoning and I'll be honest with you I ran out of taco seasoning as I was making this so then I just piled up a bunch of seasonings that I had just used um, because I do tend to like similar flavors so um, it really is kind of something easy to make even if you don't have exactly what the recipe calls for so since this is raw chicken I don't want to touch it with my hands um, to prevent any kind of cross-contamination. So I'm going to get these 
mixed up here and, and, and going. And you'll notice I put the sweet potatoes in first because they're gonna, they're gonna cook about 15 minutes and then we'll get the chicken and the broccoli in. So I will put this in a pan in the meantime so we can get it in once that timer's up before we move on to our next one. So yes, thank you. So we have some sheet pan dinner tips and the first one you'll see on the left is to check the internal temperature of your food for doneness. So a lot of times when we're cooking, especially meats, the recipe might just say, cook until brown. Well, what we know is that brown doesn't mean anything. Your food could be brown on the outside and still raw on the inside. And that puts you at risk for foodborne illnesses. And with chicken, we're really worried about salmonella. So with my chicken, I'm also gonna spread it around the pan. And then when it's done, I will take it out and use a food thermometer uh, to check the temperature. And I'll show you that in a bit. But the food thermometer, I wanted to read 165. That's the internal doneness temperature for poultry. So it could be chicken or it could be turkey or anything that's ground with chicken or turkey. And if it's not 165, it is not done. So here's my food thermometer, which I obviously won't use yet because it's still raw, but it has, um, there's a temperature currently, it's about 66 degrees in here. And so you see over here on the end, the metal tip, you see how it's kind of, maybe you can't see it if it doesn't focus, but the first, about a third of this is thinner than the remaining portion. And that's because this first portion is the sensing region. So when I'm taking the temperature, oh, there we go. That first portion is what I want to be fully inserted in the food. If I just put in the first, you know, fingertips worth of, of thermometer, I won't get an accurate reading because the sensing region goes all the way to where my finger is. That's where it becomes a little bit thicker. So I'll keep this handy for later, but I have my chicken ready to go in the oven once the sweet potatoes come out and the broccoli will go in the oven at the same time. So I'm gonna just put that over here. And let me make sure I didn't skip something. And I think when we were discussing our dinner tips, oh, thank you. Um, I did mention for roasting the vegetables, we want those separated to avoid steaming. You want to cut your veggies to similar sizes for even cooking. Um, and you want to know that certain vegetables like your potatoes will take longer. So I got those going in first. They're all similarly shaped and I know those will take longer. And then the broccoli and the chicken take about the same time. And the broccoli florets are also cut to be about the same size. So I'll pause for questions. I feel like we're in doing some magic here while we're swapping things around. If anybody has questions or comments, gladly welcome them. Well, I don't see any questions, VG, but everybody seems to be <laughs> really enjoying it. And they just want to know what time will dinner be tonight? <laughs> That's what they're well, looking you know, for. Again, if I, could, if I could virtually invite you all, I think that would be wonderful. Um, but yeah, really, no. once, all of these foods are pretty quick to cook. Once you have all your veggies prepped and cut up and everything, they'll take no more than um, 20 to 30 minutes. So, again, it's, it's a great opportunity if it's something that you can kind of set and forget, like my chili that I almost forgot is over there simmering. Um, you can go for a quick stroll. Make sure you get some physical activity in. We all know about the importance of that in staying healthy. Um but they are pretty quick and, and easy. Uh, BG, do you have gluten-free recipes? So gluten is mostly found in grains. So your things like rice, or sorry, not rice, wheat, barley, and flour. So if you're not using wheat, barley, or flour, and your ingredients that you're adding in don't have gluten listed in the ingredient, then it's gluten-free. So I think basically everything we're making today is gluten-free since I'm not using any of those. I don't think, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure all these these would all be considered gluten free, uh, and I I don't think my any of my ingredients have it. So, that's and a good one, question. Yeah, one last question in regards to the last recipe. Um, do you have a sense on how much it would cost to make it for for a family of so many? Yeah, that's a great great question. So, everything that I'm making today, I purchased all in one except for the spices because I already had those. 
and I was able to buy enough to make everything twice for $67. So I think it came out to approximately 20 servings. So that's about three bucks per serving. Wow. Um, so really, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot of food and it is, uh, you know, a big volume, but it's not that much in terms of um, money or time or, and it's all highly nutritious. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Perfect. Okay, we're going to move on to our next recipe, which is our mix and match foil packet fish. So if um, what you see there is we're going to mix a bunch of veggies. And I won't tell you amounts because this is a great opportunity for everyone, again, to customize to their flavor. Um, but the idea is it's kind of like when you go camping, you get some aluminum foil, you pile some veggies on top, and you can put in some sort of fish or seafood item and just a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper and you let the steaming in the oven do the work. So today I chose tilapia and that's what we'll feature here. So if we go back to the overhead, I can show you that preparation and, it, and it'll be pretty simple. So I'm actually gonna use, um, I have a bigger um, piece of foil that I had cut out earlier. So I'm gonna lay that down and the first thing I want to put down is um, my potatoes. So I have some sliced potatoes here. And this is about three of those little ones. So again, remember the potatoes will take longer to cook. They need more heat. So I'm going to put those at the bottom and then kind of layer all my veggies on top. And what's cool about this one is you can use whatever veggies are in the fridge. It does not matter. Um, and if you're cooking for multiple people and someone doesn't want onions in theirs or someone wants extra peppers, they can do that too. It's a great way to get kids involved um, in the potatoes down. And I'm using, today I'm using red onions and orange bell peppers. So I'll just kind of get some down. And in the meantime, I'll let you know that some of these will change colors once they cook and steam. Some of that is chemical, some of that is heat related. So for example, if I sprinkle some lemon juice, which I will, um, it might change the color of those um, onions. They might turn a little bit darker. So don't be alarmed, that's normal. So I have onions and I have bell peppers. I'm gonna throw in some spinach get a variety of colors. That's usually what we talk about in nutrition is making sure that you're consuming a variety of colors. Each color has different vitamins and nutrients and each vitamin and nutrient does something different. So you want to make sure you get a variety every day, but throughout the week as well. I have a bit of olive oil. Again, can't go wrong with olive oil. Any kind of oil is better than your solid butters or lards or anything like that. Um, so olive oil tends to be an easy one that I go to. I tend to use canola oil as well if I'm cooking something at a higher temperature. So just a bit of salt and pepper, nothing crazy. And then I'm going to add my tilapia. You could use, again, any kind of fish, any kind of seafood. And in the handouts, which are a copy of the slides that you're seeing, probably, I got this recipe from the Food Network and they have a variety of options there. They have shrimp, they have salmon, they have all sorts of fish, um, different recipes and sauces. So I'm gonna top my fish with some dill and I happen to um, come across some fresh dill, but just in case, I also have my dry dill. Dill and fish tend to go well. I also have some dry parsley. Could have just as easily used the dry stuff. It doesn't always have to be fresh. And when you use dry, you can typically get away with less. So I'm actually going to save the parsley for later and make sure I top it with some more olive oil, a bit of lemon juice for flavor, and again, just a little bit of salt and pepper. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up. I'm kind of going long ends first, and I didn't need this much 
um, aluminum foil, but I just, I happened to have cut it earlier and didn't use it. So I'm folding it down kind of along the top there. And then I want to fold my sides outside into the top so that the water or the, the juices don't flow out. So I'm going to fold them in towards the top there. If I had folded them underneath, then some of that could have leaked out. Bring it around. And that's that. And these would go in the oven at 450 for about 15 minutes. So again, if you were making more than one, each person, you could write on it with a Sharpie. Each person would have their own and they could make it with a different protein, different veggies or anything like that. So that's our packet meal. And as I'm clearing up and again, taking questions, if anybody has them, I'll let you know I do have some ready made so that I can show you what it all looks like when it's done. So let me start moving these up away. Any questions so far? Any questions? That's I think people are just fascinated with what you're doing, VG. Um, but I, I don't see any hands up. I, I think everybody's getting ready to eat after this. <laughs> but no questions at this time. Just a lot of great comments reinforcing what you're doing. Great. And my audio cut out for a second. I don't know why, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, I, we okay. Can, I can hear you. Wonderful. All right. So... Since I knew that we would only have so much time today, I did pre-prepare one of everything so that I could show you what it would look like when it was done. So let me start with that. Um, here is what would happen once we finished our sheet pan dinner. So what I did first, as you saw, I put the sweet potatoes in the oven. And once those cooked for about 15 minutes, I put the chicken in and I kind of scooted the sweet potatoes and gave the broccoli a bit more room. So both trays went back in another 15, and then they were done. I did, once the, once the food came out, check the chicken with my food thermometer, as I mentioned, so that the temperature would be safe to eat, that 165. So that's what that one would look like. And I'm just going to plate one, because you know you got you have to have the finished product. You can't, I can't just leave you guys with these things on a sheet pan. So... I'm going to show you about how much I would plate. So that might be about three ounces, three to four ounces of protein, depending on um, what your goals are and what you're trying to consume um, calorie wise and all that. So my sweet potatoes, I'm going to take some and these are starchy. They're considered a starchy vegetable. So that could easily be swapped by some pasta or rice and get maybe about a cup's worth there. And then my remaining side of the plate, I'm sure it's in focus there for you, I would get my broccoli. And the great thing about broccoli, it's a non-starchy vegetable. It's a cruciferous vegetable. It's extremely good for our health. And there you see some magic in the background. But there's a nice hefty dinner plate. And I could have plated probably um, four of these, depending on how much I was putting in. So... There's dinner made, some a sheet pan dinner with your roasted sweet potatoes, broccoli, and your taco-flavored chicken strips. So fun, easy meal. The next one I will plate for you is our chili. So I had already, yeah, I had already kind of finished the chili just in case for the sake of time. So here is that chili that came out um, pretty creamy. And for this one, I did have more liquid. So I could plate this over top of some brown rice to get a bit of extra fiber and, and some more carbs and energy or just eat it by itself if I'm not trying to do that. So I'll show you that here. We have our chili with some corn, cannellini beans, chicken. Whoa. Overflowing there. So here's my chili. I could top it with some tortilla chips, just a few for crunch. I'm definitely going to top it with some cilantro for flavor and color. We eat with our eyes first. 
And you could also put in some avocado if you wanted extra calories and some healthy fats. So there's that one. And you can see how much is left in the bowl in comparison. So if that's one serving, I could easily get at least six out of here. So that one is done. And then the last thing we have to show you is our fish. Let me get this out the way so we can bring the fish. Okay. So our fish has only been in for about um, 16 minutes and it may have needed a full 20 at a lower temperature. But we're going to see what happens. I'm going to let it rest for just a minute or so, so I don't burn myself with the aluminum foil. But hopefully we have a nice reveal here. And the aluminum foil doesn't get as hot. The steam might get. So here's our packet meal with our fish. I'm not sure if it's done, so I'm going to check it with my food thermometer. And in the slides, you'll have that for fish, we want it to be at 145. So let's see. So if I put my thermometer in sideways, I see it, it's still coming up, but it's slowing at about one, probably 120. So that lets me know this fish needs just a little bit more for it to be done. So I would assume probably another five, five or six minutes and that would be done. And this went in right when the potatoes went in. So <coughs> this I prepared it earlier, but it's been cooking just as long as we've been chatting. So this one can go back in. And then that will be it as far as our food demo. I think I had one more tip for the packet meal, which is the fish that we just saw. If you want to pull that slide up, please. It's our packet meal tips. And that one was pretty straightforward. It's when you're cooking these packet meals, you want things to be thin so they cook quickly. What's cooking, what's helping it cook is some of that internal steam in that packet. So cutting those vegetables thin, those potatoes were really thin at the bottom, everything else was thin strips. Placing your harder veggies at the bottom, we talked about that, like the potatoes down there. If you're using poultry, you wanna pound it or cut it thin. Fish, that fish fillet was pretty thin to begin with, so I didn't have to worry about that. You could easily do any kind of protein there. And then you saw that last one checking the temperature for doneness. So since I saw on the food thermometer, it wasn't done yet. I'm just going to put it back in for another five minutes or so. And that was what I had prepared for you today for our live cooking demo. You saw me make three quick meals, three easy meals, super healthy meals um, that would be enough to get you through the week or get a couple people through the week, depending on how many meals they have. And just picture our fish would be right here once we are all done. <laughs> all right, Ron, um, back to you. If you have thoughts, comments, questions, I'll gladly take them. Well, I'll tell you, uh, VG, uh, we, everybody loves what you've done. The camera angles, I'm, I'm not sure how you got it all done <laughs> like that. And you got everybody hungry. Everybody says that they're interested in you coming to where they live and doing the same presentation and bring your mother. That would be fun. Uh, but uh, I, I just think people love that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not seeing a bunch of questions, but I, it took a lot of time and effort on your part to prepare. Uh, and what a highlight for, oh, wait a minute. We, we got a hand up from the Lieutenant Chambers. Lieutenant Chambers, unmute, please. Hey, so, hey, VG, that was that was wonderful. I'm still in the question from Miss Anna Marie uh, Arnold. OK. Um, and Miss Anna Marie Arnold is always perplexed at how we can eat raw fish, a.k.a. sushi, but we need to check the temperature. Why is sushi OK? Yes, great question. Sushi grade fish has been frozen in order to kill the pathogenic, you know, whatever, whatever could get us sick in it. So typically it is still handled very carefully um, so that we're not contaminating it with anything extra that the fish would not have by itself. But then when they freeze it, they are able to kill off some of the pathogens that would get us sick. So when you see sushi grade fish, it was always frozen on purpose in order to keep it healthy. Um, other fish, if it's freshly caught or if it's, you know, it's been frozen, but now it's in the fridge, so it's thawed out for a bit it might give some time for those pathogens to grow 
And that's why we check the temperature because we know that while it may or may not have been frozen at some point, some other things could have happened in the meantime to allow it to get contaminated and potentially get us sick. Great question. Great. We have another question from uh, James. James, unmute, please. Yes. Is that the same premise when it comes to like beef? Like people eat it like they steak like rare or whatever. It has to be frozen first. And it kills all the bad things in it. And that why eating a piece of beef rare or medium is not as bad for you. I can say it's good for you, but not as bad as eating like chicken raw. Over. Right. So great question again. And, and all of those, um, Lieutenant Chambers, you're welcome to flip back to that slide that had the temperatures. Each different animal protein and each, each different food really has a recommended temperature where we know the food is safe to consume. And that is based off of what we know, what kinds of pathogens would live on that. So as I mentioned with poultry, we're concerned about salmonella. And we know that if we cook the chicken to where it gets to that 165 degrees Fahrenheit, we've probably killed off most of the salmonella. You see oh. their ground meat is underneath it and ground meat doesn't have to cook quite as high of a temperature, um, but still higher than fresh beef, which is right below it. And the reason for that is when you're getting ground meat, you're not getting a steak that is then ground by itself. You're getting different cuts of <clears throat> beef, you're getting different cows, you're getting different everything. So there's a lot of potential and a lot more surface area potential for that ground beef to become contaminated. And for that, we're thinking of E. coli. And we know that if we cook it to 160, we're going to kill off that E. coli. And then oh. underneath it, you see fresh beef, veal, pork, and lamb. And all those cook for 145, and then you allow them to rest for three minutes. And really, when you're thinking of those big cuts of meat, the surface area is much less. So you're only worried about the outside really getting cooked um, to, to kill off the bacteria, we don't think that there would be quite as much on the inside there. And again, the bacteria might be different. So, um, so it, it kind of varies. There is still some risk which, with eating beef rare or raw if it's not cooked to that 145, which it may not get done to that, to that level. Um, and that's why you see that disclaimer in any restaurant menu where it says consuming undercooked beef or products may cause you to get food foodborne illness. So it's still a risk that you take when you're when you're choosing to eat foods that are not done to that recommended temperature, but you can kind of weigh the pros and cons yeah. there of thinking how 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 well has my meat been handled or if if it's a big um, steak or something like that, as long as the outside is seared and then hopefully you're killing off a good of the potential bacteria there. Okay, VG. Um, yes. By the way, I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with us. I mean, how intriguing was <laughs> it? But, we, you know, we have a couple of polls. Uh, everybody should be connected uh, with your phone, but we have a couple of polls from uh, VG's presentation. So I, if we can get the poll to come up, did you learn something new from VG today? Give us an A for yes, give us a B for no. Did you learn something new from VG today? Yes and no, you're already connected. Uh, and let's see what some of the results are. I'm sure 83%, look at, look at it, 90, wow. So you, you taught people things, VG, so that's, that's great news. Um, did VG make you hungry? Hey, no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. No, will, will you be trying any of these recipes or techniques? That would be an interesting question. A, yes. B, no. Will you be trying any of these recipes? Uh, and I will tell you, VG, I, I've already copied it, and uh, my family is going to be cooking it. Perfect. Once again, almost, well, we're, we're hitting 90% of the people, 91% of the people. Um, at, uh, are there any other polls? I, I don't know if there's another one. I, I know that's the second one. Yeah, it was just the two, actually. Yeah, just the and, two. Yeah, thank you. And if you swap back to this overhead projection, um, my awesome sous chef and mom checked out the fish for us, brought it out, and I did check it, and the temperature went up to um, 146 when I checked. We'll see what it does here. It's 145. I'm not sure if you can read that 150 yeah, so this one. fish is definitely done and safe so here we have all three meals that we prepared um for you today 
Well, let's let's give a great hand to VG. And uh, by the way, we just got a hand up from Mrs. B, uh, Miss Beals. If you'd like to say something, unmute, please. Yes, actually, it was. It's just the whole day has been amazing. Um, I do want to steal a question from the chat box. It says, "What is your biggest challenge with meal planning, and how do you combat that? Do you have any guidance for us there, VG?" Sure. I think the biggest um, hurdle in meal planning is just planning, right? So really just taking the time of out of your day to think through what you're going to eat. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to think through kind of like what you see here is what proteins and what vegetables am I going to eat? The rest of the stuff, the starch, I could easily, you know, pull out some rice or some pasta, bread, tortillas. So as long as I have fresh veggies that I can kind of cook and um, truly, if if you remember that tray of sweet potatoes and broccoli, I don't have to eat that with with just the chicken that I made. I can make something else, put that in between, make a bowl out of it. So as long as I have a basic idea of throughout the week, which vegetables am I going to eat? Which vegetables do I want to get and not mm -hmm. let them go to waste? Um, and then a couple of proteins that I can think through. It doesn't have to be super thorough. Cooking doesn't have to be super challenging as long as you have your staples, like your spices and things like that, then you can give food different flavor profiles throughout the week. So I hope that's helpful in, in meal planning for you folks as well. Yeah, it, it is, VG. And, and by the way, again, on, on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you so much for the time and the effort and the um, knowledge that you've been able to impart. We thank you so much uh, for being with us today and, and sharing this, this food recipe thank and you. your cooking. And say hello to your mother. Everybody wants yes. to make sure that thank your mother for helping out. <laughs> and what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Lynn Schultz and Dr. Shanks and Miss Beals if I can get you back on the on the program. I I I, I, I want to get some final words. My God, uh, there's so much great information that building healthy military communities and have put together. But uh, Miss Shanks. Um, and uh, Lynn and Miss Beals, uh, do we have any closing comments? Yeah, so th this is actually Amber Beals. So I'm the director with um, Alabama Army Reserve Family Programs. And just from the 80 81st Readiness Division Family Programs Office in general, we just want to thank everyone. It's just been amazing the past three days, the amount of information the amount of resources, uh, the fabulous cooking demonstration. I mean, every step of the way, I know we've all had an opportunity to learn and grow. And the only downside to this is if people walk away from this and they don't take this information out and share it with the rest of the soldiers and the families and the units that they go back to. And one of the things that I would say over and over again is to please know that you have a beautiful support network of community partners that are around to support and to help. And so the one thing that I would say is please don't keep this a secret. Please share the information and consider the opportunity of bringing this to your BA weekends, your family days, how you can connect your soldiers and your families to all of these resources. This would be all for naught if we just walk away and say, wow, that was really cool, but we didn't say a word to anyone else about it. So please don't let it stop there. And I please would encourage you to get in touch with your family program staff. We are here and excited to support you and help you all the way. We just need you to reach out to us. So just thank you to everyone. It's been amazing. Thank you, Amber. Dr. Shanks, uh, any closing comments from our three days together? Wow. Wow, I'm, I'm not sure what that was. It sounds like a train was going by. Uh, Lynn Schultz, are you there with us? Lynn, Dr. Shanks, are you available for some closing remarks? Okay, one, one last request, and, and I hope everybody can Hello. hear me. Yeah, hi, Lynn. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. 
Yes, this is Dr. Shanks. I'm sorry. I'm just having some difficulties here with my technology, but it's been an awesome week. Uh, we have learned uh, a great deal of information that we can share with our service members. Uh, all the speakers have brought us a pleasure of information that we can use in, uh, in, in helping to enlighten our service members and their families. And I've just been uh, so enlightened to be a part of this collaboration. I look forward to what else is coming down the pipe that we may be gain uh, greater information and so that we can share. So I am thankful uh, for everything that I have heard uh, from Florida and from Alabama, as well as I hope that you have learned a lot of information from the Mississippi team as well. So thank you very much and uh, God bless you all and have a wonderful holiday season and stay safe out there. Thank you. Oh, very good. Thank you. And uh, Lynn Schultz, coordinator from Florida. Do we have a, any closing comments from yourself, Lynn? Lynn, are you with us? Okay. Uh, so what I want to do is I look. Let, let me just make some closing comments myself. I, I, I want to thank our hosts, the Army Reserve Family Programs and Building Healthy Military Families. Thanks for, yeah, hey, thank you for allowing me to even be part of this. I, I hope I added a little something to it. Uh, even though I didn't do any cooking for anybody today. But most of all, thank you, each and every one of you, for your time and your participation, because it's it's what really drives us in doing what we're doing. And, and I really hope that everybody has found something interesting that you can take out. And as you heard from Amber Beals, my God, take it to the streets, take it to the force, take it to people, and share this information. It would be so helpful. And... I think everybody knows I've been leaving little quotes uh, from Virginia Satar. Uh, what an unbelievable lady she is. Satar is S-A-T-I-R. She's a pioneer in family therapy. But but I want to share just one last thing that she had stated. Uh, she, she, she says, I want to get, I want you to get excited about who you are, what you are and what you have and what you can still be for yourself. I want you to inspire you to see that you can go far beyond where you are right now. And here was a lady that's a pioneer in family therapy. What, what a great quote. So thank you, everybody. Be safe during the holidays. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. And take care of the force. We love you. We care about you. And thank you so much for joining us. And that concludes our presentation for today.